everybody. It's time to start service. We get you to stand with us tonight. Let's just take a second. Let's open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and your grace and mercy in our lives. We thank you for this wonderful season. It's an incredible week that we get to celebrate. But your love and sacrifice and your resurrection, God. We just pray that we open our hearts before you tonight and we worship you in spirit and truth. From the very opening note of music through the very last amen, let our hearts be just completely focused on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
side I've been washed by the blood Amen Thank God my sins are forgiven I've been washed by the blood What a wonderful, wonderful promise that we have Someone with a request in there
And someone else. Um, you guys know where to come in? I know that part. Do you guys know who does the? Do you guys know who the does the levels? You guys will figure it out. Okay. Uh, Robin, testify while we pull the stuff. It's a long time, so bear with us.
Someone else tonight. I, I can't hear. I don't. We don't got that one. Sorry. Yeah, I, we don't have that one quite yet. Uh, what's that called? Is that what it's called? Power scene? Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Okay. Then you testify while I find it.
Amen. Let him mold us and make us. Someone else tonight. fire. Jose say that? Amen. Jose testify. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in and When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning And I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me was another in the waters holding back the seas and should I ever need reminding how I've been set free there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me there is another in the fire for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore and should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning either way I will bow to the things of this world and I know I will never be alone there is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding, what power set me free? There is a grave that holds nobody, and now the power lives in me. There is another in the fire. Oh, 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 and I can see the light in the darkness. I 
There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come and be in this place between all the things I've seen and this reckoning. And I know I will never be alone. And I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding, how could you be to me? I call the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be yes. And I can see the light in the darkness As the darkness bows to hell I can hear the roar in the heavens As the space between waves thin I can feel the ground shake beneath us As the prison walls gave in Nothing stands between us There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding, how could you be to me? I got the joy come every battle, because I know that's where you'll be. the joy from every battle cause I know that's where you'll be I got the joy from every battle cause I know that's where you'll be I got the joy from every battle cause I know that's where you'll be I got the joy from every battle cause I know that's where you'll be Amen. He's always there. You may be seated tonight. I want to say God bless everybody who's here. Welcome. I know this is a, a busy, busy week. It's been a busy week for all of us here at PFGF and lots going on and working for the Lord and getting ready for Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday and looking forward to all those things. And I want to invite all of you out um, Friday night, 7 o'clock. Good Friday service. Be here. We'll have a wonderful time. I promise, I promise, I will use words like Calvary and the blood of Jesus Christ and resurrection. And we'll talk about what it does from its saving power and its saving grace to its eternal victory over death, hell, and the grave. And we'll use those words because, you know, I, I battle this thing, and I, I know that the media coordinator that put that out had, you know, I don't, I don't think it was done with a bad heart. I think it was done with great intention. But, you know, the truth of the matter is we get so seeker friendly and trying to not offend people with the gospel that we forget that the gospel is good enough on its own. It's never needed me or you to, to moderate it or make it palatable for anyone. Just give it to them. Don't beat them up with it. Just give it to them and let Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do what they do because it's their job to make it relatable. So we're going to do just that. We're going to talk about the precious shed blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about his death on a cross, and we're going to talk about his victorious resurrection. And it's going to be a wonderful time. So be here Friday evening, 7 o'clock, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Tomorrow morning at 9.30 is our Bible study, so be here for that. Tomorrow night at 7.30 is worship practice for our worship team. 
Um, and we're back to regular schedule next week, I think, and we'll jump back into regular things. So ask our ushers if they'll come tonight. We're going to receive our evening offering. Give us unto the Lord and let him bless you as he always does. Amen. Right before we uh, go to the Word tonight, I asked Alani to sing a song. This was requested last week as one of our uh, our songs. I think it's tuned up over there. Uh, but it was a solo song, so I asked him if he would do that for us on Sunday, but the Holy Spirit moved to give the chance to. So we're going to ask him to do that tonight, and he's going to come and sing Father's House. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, well, my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, because that's what my father does. Yeah, failure won't define me, because that's what my father does. shame out the door cause it ain't welcome anymore ooh you're in the father's house arrival's not the end game the journey's where you are you never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. And failure's never final when the Father's in the room. And failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Ooh, they open it down. Check your shit. 
shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Yes, in the Father's house Yeah Prodigals come home The helpless find hope And love is on the move when the father's in the room, prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life, and love is on the move. When the father's in the room, miracles take place, the cynical find faith, and love is breaking through. When the father's in the room, Jericho walls are quaking. Strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. And love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Oh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here at the Father's house, check your shame out the door. Cause it ain't welcome. down oh here at the father's house check your shame out the door cause it ain't welcome anymore oh you're in the father's house Amen. Too often, uh, we carry our junk. God said, just leave it at the door. <laughs> Set it down. Let it go. Let it go. Amen. I want to, in, in, that, in line with that, um, this has been on my heart, and I heard a young man say something about this the other day, and it just kind of checked my spirit. And, you know, when this week comes, I go through, and as a pastor, I kind of go through this mode of how should I approach the week? How should I approach what I say on a Wednesday, what I say on Friday, what I say on Sunday? The different times where Jesus is in his walk before he gets to the cross and all those things. And should I go that route or should I go another way? And one of the things that's really cool is in our Bible study on Thursday mornings, we're in that part of John where Jesus is just communing with his disciples. After the Passover supper, they're kicked back, they're talking, he's sharing life with them, he's giving them all this stuff, he's telling them who's going to betray him, but he's giving them all this life in the middle of all that. And it's this wonderful, wonderful time, where it's, but it's really intimate. And it's just this conversation with Jesus. you got 12 guys, then it drops to 11 guys, sitting with Jesus and communing and just enjoying this time. And, and, and they're getting a little bit of, of life. They're getting a little bit of love. They're getting a new commandment. They're getting all of these things. And they, they get a little reproach too, you know. Ask Peter. Stop running off at the mouth, man. You're going to curse me. <laughs> you're going to betray me. Come on. You're going to just deny you even know me. So when in the middle of all this, I think it's just it's one of the, one of the greatest parts of Scripture and I just enjoy it so much. And I thought about what's part, what a big part of that is, is how we take things to Jesus, how we're able just to have that relationship with him. Because of what he does on the cross and because of his resurrection, we're able to have a relationship. And how often do we not come into that relationship? Do we not allow ourselves to take full advantage of the relationship? How often do we do that? Do we, do we not really... Give him everything. We're trying to figure out other ways to handle, handle life and do things. And how often do we not just bring it to Jesus? Right? How often do we just, we're trying to figure out how we're going to solve our money problems, how we're going to solve our family problems, how we're going to fix this one and that one and all the other things. And you never, never called to fix anybody anyway. You are ill-equipped. You are not equipped to fix people. You can show them the way of life, but you can't fix anybody. That's God's, that's God's job. 
That's a Jesus thing. That is not a you thing. You'll mess that up every day because you don't have the power. But you do have words of life that you can give them, right? So coming into the relationship with Jesus and understanding, if that's the way it is in my life, why shouldn't I just bring everything to him? How many times when you have a problem do you immediately go to your best friend? You get your bestie and you go to your bestie and you talk about your problem. Girls, how many times you have a problem with your husband, you go to your girlfriend and you talk about your husband? Liz said she couldn't count them. Um, or you go to your mama. Or you go to your sister. I was fixing it for you. You know, it's all these, it's so many things that we have. We got all these resources. Why is it God like at the top of the list of the resources we go to? Didn't we grow up in the church singing, now let us have a little talk with Jesus, those of us who grew up in the church. Let us tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer will turn in, then you'll know a little fire is burning, and you'll find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. If grandma said a little talk with Jesus was enough, shouldn't that be enough? Or because Bill Gates said you need something else in your life, you got to go to something else. Or because Elon Musk says you need something else in your life, you got to go to something else, right? Or because some liberal sitting on a, on a chair someplace says you need something else. Or because some conservative sitting on a chair someplace says you need something else. Or some independent says you need something else. Some rumor mill says you need something else. I want you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. I'll have the Amplified up here for you because I want you to hear this kind of blown up a little bit. Now, before I do that, let me me make sure you understand the book of Hebrews a little bit. The book of Hebrews, and we believe it was written by Paul, although there's no absolute authority that can tell us exactly who wrote it, but we believe it was written by Paul. That's my opinion. He starts this particular book off with a purpose, and that purpose is to tell the religious about the truth of their new high priest, Jesus Christ. It is a book to the, no, there is no church. It's to the Hebrews. It's in the title. Now, it's good for all of us, okay, but he literally writes this particular paper that he writes to the church, or to the future church, to the Hebrew people, to the Jews. It's written so they can understand the transition from the old way of the law, the fulfillment and completion of the righteousness portions of that law in Jesus Christ, bringing them into the new high priest, which is him. That's the purpose of the whole book. Instruction to the Jews on how all that takes place and who Jesus is. But as he gets into Hebrews 4, he says something here in the 4th through the 16th verses. And I want to read this because I believe it's it's beautiful. In fact, you know, I'll just read it up there. Probably easier for me to see anyway. Inasmuch then as we, the believers, okay, have a great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith and cling tenaciously to our absolute trust in him as a Savior. He starts this little passage off by saying this to him. I want you to understand, in as much as we, the believers, the ones who already know this, we know that we have our new high priest. We know who he is. We know his identity. It's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We understand who he is. Let us hold fast to our confession of faith that we're making. But you can't make a confession of faith and let that be enough. you got to hold on to it. How does the, the, the writer expand this or amplify it? He says this, cling tenaciously to our absolute trust in him as Savior. That's how you hold on. You cling tenaciously to the absolute trust that you have in him as your Savior. You can't do that by running to everybody else with your problems. You 
You can't claim. Look, if, if, if my wife says I'm her husband, she wears my ring that I bought with my money to identify that she's taken, don't touch. But she runs off to some other man all the time. Hmm? I don't care if she got it on or she takes it off. She don't get to run off to another man. Because if she takes it off, there's an indent where it was. You can see the evidence that it was there. It don't look the same as the one next to it, does it? And I ain't going to just show them because I'll get myself in trouble because the wrong fingers will go up. So we'll leave all three up. That's all I need for that to be on camera. And somebody's like, oh, look at that pastor. But you can see this ring finger is, looks skinnier down here than the other two, doesn't it? Fat, fat, skinnier. There's evidence that it belonged to somebody, or at least I did. And she doesn't get to go off and give of herself to another man. Mm -mm. That is, a, that is a, a crime that has the penalty of death. It is. It's adultery. And if Jesus doesn't get him, I'll kill him anyway. It's not going to happen. I got no problem admitting that. If she runs off with some guy, you might y'all come visit me in jail because that's where I'm gonna be. I'm just telling you straight up, I know me. Just being honest. It's church, we can be honest. Because I'm not gonna let that go. Right? You know why? Because I ain't gonna train another one. It's been 33 years. We're done. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Baby, I'm joking. But the truth of the matter is this, is that I have an identity and I will cling tenaciously to that identity with her. I do all the time. And if I will do that with my wife, how much more should I do that with my Savior? But I can't say that he's my ultimate, he's my all in all, he's my everything, if I'm going around giving some of it to everybody else or giving some of it to Satan or giving some of it to the government or giving some of it to the people in the church. I may come to you and ask you to pray with me, but I'm not going to come to you and ask you to solve my problem. I need to go have a little talk with Jesus. When I came in, my mom was playing on the piano, she was playing, I must tell Jesus. All of my troubles, right? A couple old songs. But the old songs say, I got to go to Jesus, not to my friends. My friends are helpless to fix me. And most of the time, Julie, when I come to somebody and I got a problem, it's me that needs to get fixed. It's me. Because even if there's something that I'm missing or something I don't have, it's okay not to have it as long as I'm clinging tenaciously to the absolute trust in him. It'll be all right, because whatever it is I don't think I have over here, he's just making room for me to have something else. He just opened up a door for me somewhere else. So cling tenaciously, verse number 15. He says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize and understand our weaknesses and our temptations, but one who has been tempted knowing exactly how it feels to be human in every respect as we are, yet without committing any sin. One of the things that too often we come into is this unrelatable Jesus. Too, too many times, even in churches, we'll come out to an unrelatable Jesus. Well, he's God. He can't relate to me. He came to the earth so he could relate to you. He loved you that much that he set aside his deity and he walked into a human fleshly body and was tempted in, the Bible teaches us right here, in every respect as you and I are. You know what that means? He was tempted sexually. He was tempted to be a drunkard. He was tempted to be a liar. He grieved. He felt pain in his body. Everything you've got going on, he's been there, done that. 
And in all of that, all of that temptation, everything Satan could put in front of him, his pride was tempted on the mount of temptation. He was tempted so much. But in all of that, he did not commit any sin. Not even an oops. Why? Because for the joy of you, he held on and endured all that he had to endure for you. But when it comes time and you have a need, where do you go? When you're in pain, is your first thought the doctor or is your first thought to pray? Think about it. There's so many things we could put in that category, church. So, And every one of us, if we go around this room tonight, and every one of us could say something that's going on in our life, and we'd all have something different. They might kind of relate to each other a little bit, but it would be different because every one of our lives are unique. Every one of us is unique. And we got something going on right now that we got to take to Jesus. And stop taking it to our brother and sister and husband and wife and mama and daddy, grandma and grandpa, kids, whatever your outlet is, best friends, in-laws and outlaws, whoever you're taking it to. Your therapist ain't going to fix it. Now, I got nothing against you going to therapy if you need therapy. I don't have a problem with that. You, should, you need to go to Christian therapy, not to, not to voodoo crazy therapy. Go to Christian therapy, okay? If you need one, we know a few. Not the voodoo. <laughs> There's a reason we never give her a microphone. But all of that stuff that you face and all that you go through, your first outlet needs to be Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He wants to know. The Bible teaches us, says, cast your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Not because you can, but because he cares for you. Cast your cares upon him because you got no place else to go. There's a song. I like the song, but I quit singing it years ago. It's called, When Jesus is All That I Have, He's All That I Need. It's a cool song, and I love, When Jesus is all that I, you know, it's great. I love the beat, and it's fast, blah, blah, blah. But I got to thinking, why do I wait till he's the only thing left? Felt like I was singing the wrong message. Felt like I was like, wait a minute, that's that's you know, that's like that Jesus never failed me yet business. Jesus never failed me, period. I know they had good intentions when they wrote it, but I don't think they thought it through very well. Because he doesn't fail. And he says, come to me because I care for you. Not because you have the ability to, not because you've earned it, not because you deserve it, but because I want you to. I desire you to. I will pay the price so you can. And I'm the only one who can fix you anyway. Come to me. So all the things that you've gone through, Jesus knows. And not only does he know them, but he knows them intimately. Intimately, he faced them in himself. Not secondhand, firsthand. He knows them. And he knows how to get through it without sin. I don't have any friends or family that I can go to with my situations that knows how to get through all of them without sin. Not one person. Because every person in my family, my friends set, and everybody else around me has sin. I've got one who's never sinned. I've got one who has defeated death, hell, and the grave. He's overcome it all, and that's the one I want to go to. Verse number 16. He says, therefore, let us with privilege approach the throne of grace. That is the throne of God's gracious favor with confidence and without fear. Let us, as as the other translation, let us boldly approach. 
Let us come before it. Let's do it with the privilege that God has given us, with the grace that he's given us, and with this incredible confidence, knowing without any fear that we may receive mercy for all of our failures and find his amazing grace to help in our time of need, an appropriate blessing coming just at the right moment. That's what coming to God is about. We come to him without fear, in confidence, boldly coming before the throne of God, which he has established for us, that throne of grace, he's established it just for us to come. It's his favor given to us. He did it on purpose for you and me. He didn't need it. He created it for you and me. And when he did, he said, I want you to come, and I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to come covered by my blood. Don't be afraid to come, because covered by the blood, there is no sin. And you can walk boldly into the throne room of God without sin. Can't walk in there with sin. Satan had to stand outside and wait for God to say it's okay to come in. My Bible teaches my father, he says, come to me boldly. Come to me confidently. Come to me without any fear. You know, when I was, I was a little kid, and if I was afraid or something was going on or I had a problem or trouble, if I, would, if I needed my parents, I would just go. In fact, I would still, if I, if I need something from my mom, I'm just going to go. I'm a little more afraid these days, but I'll go still. But I, I, there's no fear in that because there is a relationship, right? You feel this relationship and you know that you will be accepted and you can go. And when you're a little bitty kid, there's no other place of safety. Right? Dad's Superman, mom's Wonder Woman, and they could do anything. Somewhere we learned that that's not quite the case. My kids are still trying to figure it out. They haven't quite figured it out. I'm not, but I think they're getting there. No, I'm telling you, it is one of those things where we, right? You have that incredible, I've told you stories, but my dad would tell me things that weren't true. He would give me these, he'd play these jokes on me. The, the, the best one he ever did to me was when he told me that, that uh, all the people on TV, that they all lived in the TV. Don't look at me like that. I was like five years old. What was I supposed to do? My dad would, knew everything. My dad wouldn't lie to me. He did. That's right. He straight up did. So I go to, I go to school, and I'm telling everybody at school, all the kids at school. Well, my dad said it. It's got to be right, right? That's two. So I got this little five-year-old kid. I'm running around. I'm telling everybody, oh, you're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. And people still live in there. If I could get inside the TV, I'd pull one out and show you. (laughs) You know what that was? That was blind faith. That was a confidence in my father. Because he hadn't broken that confidence yet. That went away quick after this little episode. Right? Right? I got educated by my teacher at that particular point, and all of a sudden I would look like kind of stupid to the kids, and that kind of broke my heart. But up until that particular point, there was there was nothing. Wouldn't it be great if you and I, with our frame of reference and knowledge of God, could go back to exactly what God called us to, which is a childlike faith? We preached on on Sunday morning about out of the mouths of babes. Wouldn't it be amazing if we just get back there and we could stand in front of anybody, it didn't matter who it was, and just tell them what our dad said and we didn't care what they thought about it. With boldness and confidence, without fear, without hesitation, and just stand there and say, I don't care what you say. Man, I don't want to talk about the blood of Jesus Christ because it's real. I want to talk about salvation because he saved me. I'm going to talk about the stuff that I know that my God has done and he's told me. And I'm going to live it out. I'm not just going to tell you about it. I'm going to live like it. And when I get in trouble, I'm going to be just dumb enough to believe he's going to take care of me and I'm just going to go talk to him. Some of you need to be less smart than you think you are. I hope you got that the way I meant it. I didn't say less smart than you are. I said less smart than you think you are. Because you may think you are, but you probably aren't. Especially if you're not going to Jesus first. 
there's a level of spiritual ignorance that's flowing around your head and your life and your soul if you're not taking it to him first. Let's get childlike again. Not immature, but blind faith childlike. Okay? Be mature in God. Be mature Christians. But walk around with a blind faith for what he says. You know what that blind faith means? It means that if he said it, there's just absolutely no way it can't be true. Absolutely cannot not be true. It is absolutely 100% without a doubt, in fact, unequivocally true. And I have absolutely zero reason to doubt it, and I will not doubt what he said. I'm not going to let it go. But you know why we don't get there? It's, it's us. It's not him. It's us. Because we don't trust him fully. Some of you can't trust him with your whole heart. You hold on to bits and pieces of it. I give God everything, but I, I got to work on this. I got to work on this. All you need to do is give to Jesus. Have a little talk with Jesus. Some of you, it's your finances. I said this on Sunday, and I, I don't talk much about money. I don't, I don't, I don't want to. But I'm tell you right now, if you don't tithe, you are not being f- biblically faithful. That's God. That's not me. I've said this many times. With or without your tithe, my God will supply all my need according to his riches and glory. That will happen because I'm going to be his child and I'm going to be dumb enough to believe it. But if you're not being faithful with your finances and you're not tithing, you are not being faithful to God. Better check yourself. Better check your relationship. Because it's truth. It's the only place in the Bible when you read and God says you're a thief and a robber. He just calls you names about it. <laughs> it just gets, he gets right up straight in your face and gets after it. And it's, well, people just want the money and all. No, you know what? Once again, I don't care. I don't care. Be faithful to God. And I can give you example after example and testimony after testimony from family after family after family of when they're faithful to God, how God is faithful to them. Oh, but I'm doing good. I don't need any more. You need more of God. You're going to need God to be faithful. And when it comes that time, do you want in your heart? See, God's faithful, but in our own heart, there's shame that comes when we know we're not being faithful to God. And it keeps us from going and having a little talk with Jesus. It keeps us from having a confident approach, a bold approach to the throne of grace. It puts fear in our heart before we approach him. We approach him with our head down and our hat in our hand as a beggar. Instead of running in and saying, Dad, help me. That's boldness and confidence. That's what a kid who knows what his relationship is like with his parents does. My kids have no problem coming to me and asking for something. They don't always get what they ask for. Amen. That's right. But I'll tell you this. I don't ever want them not to be willing to come and talk to me. There's a lot of times I go to God and I ask for things, and God says, well, we're not going to do it that way. Let me rephrase that. Most of the time when I ask God for things, he says we're not going to do it that way. He's got his own way of doing stuff. But when I come to God and I say, I'm just going to submit, I'm going to be faithful, I'm going to give you all my heart, I'm going to give you all my life, I'm going to give you my, 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 my house, my cars, my finances, my stuff, it's all yours because you're the one who supplied it. Uh, to me, so it's, I need to give it back to you anyway. Whatever it is. Gave my children to God when they were babies. I gave my wife to God when we got married. I made vows that were before God, right? Do we live that out? No, we think that that's just a bunch of by words these days. That's all this stuff is these days. It's just a bunch of words we say so we can hurry up and get hitched and get to the wedding night. That's what people do these days. I was engaged for three and a half years. I had to make sure. I'm not, I'm, I'm not joking. I'm just saying because we both said we don't want to do this again. Let's try to work out all the stuff ahead of time. 
Let's go get married and go work out our stuff. Let's work it out ahead of time, make sure we get it worked out, and then let's go get hitched. Right? But I gave that all to God. And even when I wasn't always right in myself, God was still paying attention to my commitments to him. And he was requiring them of me and reminding me of them. So I challenge you, whatever's going on in your life, tomorrow, Passover, dinner, the night that Jesus is betrayed. Okay, we call it, uh, in the church world, they call it Maundy Thursday. Okay, it's a Catholic term that gets used a lot, but um, Maundy literally uh, is a, is a, uh, a word, comes from the root of, uh, of, a, of a Latin word that literally means mandate. So the word we get mandate from, it talks about the commandment that he gave, the commandment to love one another. And he was sitting there at the dinner with them. Maundy Thursday. He's going to be taken. He's going to be taken in the garden. He's going to be betrayed with a kiss. The reason I bring this out is because I've mentioned this to you many times. When I get full of pride and I get full of myself, I go back and I read that account of his betrayal, his night of beating, his night of suffering, the night of woes. And I remember what he did for me. And then I, I remember that other old song, Who Am I? Old Rusty Goodman song, Who Am I? But a king would bleed and die for. Who am I that he would say, Not my will, but thine for? Right? All of these things he's done for me. So as we go through these next couple of days and we prepare for Good Friday, Celebrate the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I want you to remember where your source is. I want you to remember where you go. And I want you to remember your faithfulness to him that gives you the confidence to get there. Amen? Don't forget it. Stand with us tonight. Good to have everybody in service with us tonight. We say God bless you. Um, I encourage you to be here Friday and Sunday. Um, Friday is going to be a special service, a time of just coming close to God and celebrating his, his sacrifice for us. So I'll be here for that. It's a wonderful time. We're going to pray and dismiss. Um, get your bulletins, get your calendars. Uh, we're already at the end of, of March. It's unbelievable. We're already through three months of the year. But God's been good. Continue to pray for those who are on our, on our bulletin or on our prayer list that God will lift them up and strengthen them as well and draw them into full health. Maybe even get to be here this weekend for Resurrection Sunday. Amen? Amen. Let's be dismissed in prayer tonight. Ask Josh if he will dismiss us in prayer, please.